harder to keep it in frame. It's actually a huge problem. Uh, mostly joking. <laughs> I know, I shouldn't complain about hair. Everyone has hair problems, I know. I know, I'm not alone. They all have hair problems, I know. Yeah, first hair problems. Okay. My hair grows very quickly. You get every two or three weeks a haircut. I cut my husband and hair. How'd that go? <laughs> it went okay, but I think that he trusted me way too much. I don't know why he did that. Yeah, I don't think I've been my trust enough for that. Uh, so I think I'm just going to go with big. Um, and then, you know, it'll be like, you know, like in the playoffs, teams, like they don't shave until the, they win the championship. Yeah, so I'll shave when we have a vaccine. You know, so <laughs> 18 months or something. All right, I think we have a quorum. I think everyone's here. We have 34 people. Uh, the attendance is running. Uh, please sign in when you can. Okay. Um, any questions for me? uh before we get started questions nothing no all right well uh we have class today and believe it or not this is our last substantive class um I, I know. I had reserved Thursday for a makeup, which we actually don't need anymore because I didn't have to cancel class for Passover. So uh, there's no class on Thursday. Or actually, it was a Tuesday before Passover. Passover is actually still going on. Um, on Tuesday, a week from today, um, I want to do a final exam review. And what I'll do is I'll go over last year's um, final exam. Um, and I'll walk you through it. And I'll walk you through what I'm expecting from you. Um, bring whatever questions you have, and I'll try and answer them to it. Um, I'm also going to hold what I call open office hours, basically uh, Thursday the 23rd from 7.30 till 9. I will just sit at my computer and I will be here, um, preferably close to the 7.30. Uh, I'll see you one at a time. Uh, the way Zoom works, it puts you in a waiting room and I can just let one person at a time. If you want to have a group session, that's fine. I can do two or three at a time, I'll let you all in. Uh, if by eight o'clock no one's there, I shall call it a night, but I'll at least, I'll be here for as long as you want me to, but just preferably before 7.30. Uh, this is your time to ask questions. Um, I'll probably do some sort of office hours during the final reading period and the final exam week. I don't really think I'll have anything formal. If you want something, just message me and I'll, I'll find a time. We're all home and we can't go anywhere. So I'm sure we'll figure out something that can work. Uh, I'm sorry. Some of you do have to go to work. I, I shouldn't say that. Um, but, but for a lot of you and for me, I uh, the furthest I've been all week is a, is a mailbox. That's about as far as I've gone. I uh, haven't gotten anywhere further than that. Instacart is a very good thing. Okay. Um, questions? No? All right. Let's try this poll question. See, it'll get, get you guys thinking for a bit. Uh, so we'll be on your phones in a few seconds. If I can do this correctly. Okay, here we go. All right, so this is a question to get you thinking. And here's your question. A owns Blackacre, a lakefront property. The government designates Blackacre a protected wildlife habitat and prohibits construction on the land. A sues the government for a taking. Which Supreme Court precedent provides the appropriate test to resolve this question. Um, Loretto, A. Hadachek, B. Penn Central, C. D is your favorite, all of the above, and E is your second favorite, none of the above. And take some time to think about that one. It's a little tricky. Okay, another maybe 20 seconds. Let's let you fill in answers. Hmm, very few responses. Huh. It's probably because it's not showing up on our phone. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it is it not working for some of you? I'm sorry, Tom, or whoever just said that. 
Mine never works. I'm sorry. Uh, I suspect that um, Reef is having issues with all these people using their software, uh, but hasn't had this issue at night. Hmm. All right. Well, let me let me read the question one more time just so you can think about it. Then I'll call on someone to answer it. Uh, by the way, who, who's up next? Just so you know, you're on deck. Who's up next? Melanie was last. Thank you for that. Melanie was last, which means the next person is Lisa. Okay, so Lisa, you're on deck in a, in a second. Um, I'll read the question one more time. A owns Blackacre, a lakefront property. The government designates Blackacre a protected wildlife habitat and prohibits construction on the land. A sues the government for a taking. Oh, here, I got an idea. I'll paste it into the chat. So for those of you who can't see it, um, you can at least read along with me. A owns Blackacre, a lakefront property. The government designates Blackacre protected wildlife habitat and permits construction on the land. A sues the government for a taking. Which Supreme Court precedent provides the appropriate test to resolve this question? A, Loretto. B, had a check, C, Penn Central, D, all the above, E, none of the above. Oh, Angie, you don't have to write it down. But anyway, that I appreciate you're a good student. Okay. All right, Lisa, are you here? You're here. I see you here. What, now, what's your background today? Yep, I can hear you. What what is that background? I can't quite. It is when they're murdering Caesar. <laughs> Why? I'm a little defensive of people and government. Oh God! I, do I have to call the Secret Service on you? <laughs> Never mind. Um, like me. All right. Uh, <laughs> you ever see the bottle of Caesar dressing with a knife in the back? Is A2 Brute? No. Yeah. Anyway. All right, Lisa, let's look at this question, okay? Um, how would you go about answering this question, right? You have a lakefront property. The government says you can't build there. Walk me through the thinking of how to resolve this sort of takings question. Quickly, I just tried to wreck my brain. Right, forget, forget, forget the multiple choice for a minute, right? In general, we've had now a couple question, sorry, a couple classes on takings. How would you go about answering this question? What, what, what's your sequencing? What's your thought process? Um, uh, I guess first would be to decide, you know, to make sure it was an actual taking. What do you mean an actual taking? What does that mean? Like, uh, going brain dead today. Um, like, it, 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 what is the terminology? Like, instead of them, you know, like using it or whatever, like they actually took it. So to make sure that it was an actual What do you taking. call that where they actually take your land? What's the name for that? So I'm looking in my notes. I'm brain dead right now, so bear with me. What are some of the cases we've studied, Lisa, that might be relevant to this question? Well, um, see, the Horn versus the Department of Agriculture came to mind at first, but I don't think that that... What's that case about? Um, I think it was like a per se taking. What's a per se taking? Um... Like they, 
the government had them to give up their pers- like their property as a condition for them to continue in, you know, in commerce. All right, Michael, are you here? I'm here. How would you go about answering this question, right? Where, where do you start? So I believe you need to start at Laredo, see if there's a permanent physical occupation, then go down to Hatchack, and then Penn Central. Oh, you, you read it from my notes, which I think I gave you last week. That's exactly right. Thank you, Michael. Okay, so we have a framework that I'd like you to think about, and the two cases today more or less follow that framework. Um, the first step you have to think about, <laughs> you can hear Miriam in the background. The first step you have to think about is, is there a permanent physical occupation? A permanent physical occupation. And that's the test from Loretto. In Loretto, you had uh, the cable company was trying to hammer in the wires in the side of the building to bring cable TV to the residents of New York. If you have the permanent physical occupation, you're, you're, you're done, right? You, you have a categorical regulatory taking, or it's called a per se taking. I think that's what Lisa was getting at before, a per se taking. And there's no balancing, right? It doesn't matter how big the incursion is. Compensation is required. Okay? But what happens if there is no permanent physical occupation? Then you have to consider some other questions. The first case we talked about this uh, on this topic is how to check. This was involved the baking of the clay bricks. And in that case, the government could shut down the brick baking because baking bricks was a nuisance. And we learned that when there is a nuisance, there's no taking. And when there's no taking, there's no requirement to provide compensation. But there's another test we have to think about. If there's no nuisance at issue, we have the Penn Central test, right? The Penn Central test, which considers what happens when your property value is being decreased, but not by 100%, but something less than 100%. And we look to what are your distinct investment-backed expectations? That is, how much have you invested in this project? that you might stand to lose. Penn Central also introduced a concept known as the parcel as the whole, right? In that case, the city restricted the air rights, that is the space above the building. Now, 100% of the air rights were killed, but the train station still operated underneath and that still generated revenue. So when you're discussing the Penn Central doctrine, you have to consider the parcel as a whole. The two cases we have today are extensions of the Penn Central Doctrine, right? So both Lucas and Murr fit within this uh, uh, Penn Central test. Lucas considers um, what it means to have a complete deprivation of value. And Murr considers what is the parcel? When you have two adjoining lots, how do you define what the parcel is? Now, these are two of probably the hardest cases we'll have all semester. I mean, we did hard stuff like covenants and stuff, but this is Supreme Court gobbledygook at its highest and worst level. Um, Justice Stevens, Justice Scalia, Justice Blackmun, Justice Kennedy, they're all fighting and they don't agree about a damn thing. Um, So both these cases are very unsatisfying. And I'm fairly confident you'll read one And then you read the other and say, how the hell are these on the same Supreme Court? And I am with you. I hate teaching these cases. I would rather teach them in con law. But here you are. You're stuck with me. Uh, We have to go through them. Does that background make sense, right? That sequencing where you start with Loretto, then you look to Hatachek, and then you consider Penn Central. And then Penn Central is these offshoots. You have Lucas, you have Murr, and a lot of other cases I've even bothered teaching you. Okay. Question so far. All right. So the answer to this question, I think. Oh, wow. All over the place. Um, no one put A, which is good. No one put B. 35% of you put C, Penn Central. 
Um, 19% of you put D, all the above, and 40% of you put none of the above. Well, E is definitely not right. Um, I don't I don't know where, why it will be E. Um, so most of you got this wrong. Um, I can go with either C or D, because I think Penn Central provides a relevant rule, but I sort of framed it in an ambiguous fashion where I think you have to look at all of the cases. Um, so I'll... I'll I'll go with C. I think C is probably the better answer, uh, but 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 definitely not E. Uh, this is a Penn Central kind of case. Um, oh, maybe you thought Lucas was the answer. Yeah, so maybe, maybe it's, I'll, I'll give it C or D. I, I would give credit for either one. This is why I don't like multiple choice questions because uh, I think I, I always fight. But it'd be either either C or D, um, and maybe E. I don't know. I think there are a lot of cases to think about. All right. All right. Uh, okay. So questions on that. Lisa, I picked C thinking about the government designation. Um, yeah, the designation matters. But I use these questions not so much to see what's right or wrong, but you're thinking about the different tests. That's sort of why I give it. They're thought-provoking questions. All right. Uh, Lucas would say E. Right, I guess Lucas might be E. <laughs> I hate multiple choice questions. All right, all the all the above are right. Fine, I'll give I'll give everyone credit. Okay, I'll give credit for E also. All right, so you're you're all right. You're, you're all winners. Um, exactly. All right, questions so far. All right, uh, I see lots of chats and I, I can't answer all of them. Uh, but Penn Central is basically the root and from Penn Central lots of cases branched off. Okay. Uh, let's start the first case. Um, Lucas uh, versus South Carolina Commission. Okay. Uh, South Carolina Coastal Commission, 1992. Uh, Terry, I think you are up next. Terry, are you here? I thought she she get, was here. I think she might have gotten knocked out. I'm here. You're here? Okay, good. I saw you got knocked out a minute ago. Uh, do you want to give us the facts, please, in Lucas? Okay, so Lucas purchased a beachfront property for uh, um, a little under a million dollars. He was going to build two residences on the lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, I, I believe it was two lots. And... Um, when he bought the property in, I believe, 19, was it 1977? Well, anyway, when he bought the property, it didn't have any ordinances or uh, any rules or anything stating that he couldn't build his uh, two uh, houses on the beach. But after two years after he bought it, they enacted a law, mm-hmm. a federal law, and the state also enacted a law stated that he could not build on the beach. Okay, very good. All right, so Terry, let's just start with a basic question, right? When he purchased the land, right, do you think he had any inkling that this sort of relationship or this sort of restriction might come around? No, because it was other properties that were um, built on the beach, but um, the, the way the laws were stated that they cannot remodel or build additional um, um, at, or add on to their property. Or if it uh, was dilapidated or they had to uh, tear it down, but they can't rebuild it. Okay, so very good. Properties were already there, which wouldn't have given him notice that two years after he purchased the property that he would not be able to build. Okay, that's very good. Thank you. Thanks so much, Terry. All right, so we have a situation here where Lucas purchases land at a very high price. This is not cheap property. And he wants to build. But two years after he acquired the land, the, the, uh, the state enacts a law that prevents construction on those properties. All right. Uh, uh, Jessica, are you here? All right, so Jessica, what's our framework? How do we start going about thinking about this question? Well, um, do you ask a 
question? Lucas. The facts and Lucas. Oh, okay. How do we... Um, well, I don't understand you're asking, but I know that um, the... Are, we, are, we, are you asking about, like, what the... I just don't understand the question. Given the facts and Lucas, how should we go about thinking how to resolve it? What's our thinking? What's our thought process? Um, well, we've got, I, I guess the first thing we would think about is, is it a nuisance? That well, what, I, gave, what, I gave your framework five minutes ago. Oh, so Loretto, you mean that framework. Okay, yes. So we start with Loretto. Is there a permanent physical occupation? Is there in this case? No, there's none. Is there someone behind you? Who's behind you? Oh, those are my parents. That's oh. the acid Lebanon last year. Oh, okay. I, I, I saw someone over your shoulder. Okay. It's so. Fire where um, Dino came from. Oh. Oh. Uh, anyway, um, so very dodgy down there. I found out once we got there. <laughs> okay. So you start with Loretto. Okay, so I start with Loretto. Um, and Loretto, you find out is there a permanent physical occupation? And the answer is. Okay. You know, what's what's the next step? Then you go to how to check and you okay. say, okay, they're taking this. Are they using police power because this is a nuisance? Okay. So stop right there. Is there a nuisance in this case? Well, that's the quite basically the government believes there is because they say, well, this is a noxious whatever. Um, ah. Yes, erosion is a noxious, harmful or noxious. I guess. Uh, Jessica, let me let me just give you one more follow-up, then I'll move on to uh, I think uh, Corbett is on on deck. Um, Jessica, what is a nuisance? We use this word in torts and prop. What does that word actually mean? Um, it's an interference with a person's enjoyment of the land. Does isn't everything a nuisance? In my book, yes, usually. All right, thank you, Jessica. Um, so we have an issue here, right? Where we said, step one, you look to Loretto. Is there a permanent physical occupation? No. Okay, that's easy. We're, we're, we're beyond that, right? Step two, we ask, is the government trying to abate a nuisance? And if you ask South Carolina, um, they said it was, right? That the government was trying to reduce the harm on a beachfront property that might result in construction, right? If you build... Um, on the beach, it can cause erosion, it can harm you know, wildlife, it can harm marine life, all, the, all these other sorts of things. Let's table for a minute the nuisance issue. And let's just assume that there's not a nuisance here. So Corbett, what's our step after we consider the nuisance? What's the third step in this framework that we've discussed? So the Penn Coal or the Penn Station? Well, which one is it? Penn Station. No, yeah, no. Well, no, there is no Penn Station. Uh, there is a Penn Coal. And there's a Penn something else. But what, what which which pen am I talking about Sorry, here? I'm um, the coal. Okay, what what's Penn Coal say? I'm sorry, Central. Penn what? Central. The interference with distinct expectations. Well, you're not wrong with Penn Coal. It's actually I'm glad glad you mentioned that. What was the holding in Penn Coal? What was the test from Penn Coal? Uh, that's what I have on my notes, the interference with distinct. I'm not asking a Penn Central, I'm asking a Penn Coal. What was the holding from Penn Coal? What's the holding of Penn Coal? What was the test Justice Holmes gave us? Oh, if regulation goes too far, it can be recognized as a taking. Ah, thank you, Corbett. Okay, so if a regulation goes too far, it's a taking. How do we know if a regulation goes too far? The balancing test. 
Okay. So the burden, the burden versus the benefit. Was that from Penn Coal? Um, what yes. case told us how to interpret Penn Coal? Um, Penn Central. Aha. Now tell me about your investment-backed expectations. What was the important test from Penn Central? Whether it interferes with the distinct expectations. Uh, just you're almost right. Distinct investment-backed expectations. Oh, okay. I mean, you're, you're like 80% of the way there, right? Okay, so thank you, Corbett. Um, so we have these two tests. Both of them begin with the word pen, which causes confusion every year with students. Pen Cole is an opinion by Justice Holmes. And Holmes says that a regulation becomes a taking when it goes too far, right? Where it diminishes value. Uh, uh, it diminishes too much value. How much is too much? He doesn't tell us. How far is too far? We don't know. Um, decades later, we get Penn Central. And Penn Central basically tells us how to interpret Penn Cole. Penn Central tells us we have to look at the parcel as a whole. We can't simply look at the air rights. We have to look at the entirety of the lot, which includes both the ground and the train station, not just the air rights. Penn Central also gives us these different factors to consider, right? The regulation goes too far when it interferes with distinct investment-backed expectations. That is, if you've invested money, quantifiably invested money, you can measure it in dollars and cents, and the regulation interferes with it too much, you might have a taking. Now, how much can interfere? Let's say you invested a million dollars and maybe a regulation interferes with $5,000. Well, that's not a big deal. Maybe it interferes with a million dollars out of 10 million. Well, that's a pretty big deal. Let's say you spent nine, you know, $10 million and this diminishes the value of your investments by you know, 90%. At some point, most courts will find that the interference is too great. It went too far. But this is invariably, my friends, a balancing test, right? A balancing test. And with a balancing test, it depends a lot on who's doing the balancing. If Justice Scalia is doing the balancing, you might get one answer. And if Justice Stevens is doing the balancing, you get a different answer. And Lord help us, if Justice Kennedy is doing the balancing, who knows what we get? We get Murr. Uh, still don't know that case. I have no idea what it means. I'll tell you. Um, but you balance. Okay? But Lucas deviates slightly from Penn Central. Scalia tried to twist Penn Central, right? So let's talk about the Scalia opinion for a minute. Scalia gives a pretty good summary of precedent. Um, Roberts gives an even better summary. Roberts' dissent in, in Murr is very good for your notes. I would base your outline on how Roberts described things because he's a much better writer than Kennedy. Kennedy's an awful writer, terrible, just, just dreck. Roberts, a fantastic writer. I am grateful that I'll never again have to edit an Anthony Kennedy opinion for a case book. There are no more. They'll never exist. Uh, I'm done with Kennedy. Uh, but Roberts writes well. Um, so Scalia explains there are two categories of regulatory actions that could be takings. Uh, the first is Loretto, which involves regulations that have a physical occupation. And in those cases, there's a taking, no matter how minute or how minimal, the invasion is. Uh, the second test is from a case called Agins versus City of Tiburon, A-G-I-N-S. Uh, I didn't assign that case, it's sort of an older case, don't worry about it. But Lucas more or less adopted Agins. And what Lucas says, or what Agins said, was when you have a regulation that denies all economically beneficial or productive use of the land, there's a taking. Again, it denies all, all, lowercase, I'm sorry, un underline all in your notes, all economically beneficial or productive use of the land. Okay? This is different from occupying the entire land, right? This is also different from diminishing all value. It's only economically beneficial value, right? So what this test does is it adds to Penn Central. 
And if it reduces the economic value of land to zero, then you have a taking. Right? In other words, you have to wipe out economic value. Right? You have to wipe out the economic value. Scalia says where there's no productive or economically beneficial use, right? You can't assume they're using their police power to sort of ben, uh, to adjust benefits and burdens. Right? So when you sacrifice all economically beneficial use, there's a taking. Does everyone get the general Scalia test, which it's, it's not new, but it was sort of the first major majority opinion to adopt this framework, right? Whether you, you get rid of all economically beneficial use. Yes, Mike, I see your hand. So you're destroyed financially. Yeah. But it's not a taking. It's not a taking under Lucas. And let me let me uh, uh, let me just respond to Mike for a minute, and I'll come back if he has any follow ups. Um, Justice Stevens, I think, raises that point about the ninety five percent in his dissent, and Scalia goes, "Well, sometimes stuff's not fair, right? Um, it's almost an all or nothing. If you show one hundred percent." deprivation of economic value, you have a taking. If we show 99%, there's not a taking. But you might still win under Penn Central. In other words, think of it like a like like a, like different layers of a game, right? You start with Loretto, right? Then you go to Hadachek, then you go to, you know, a, a, a Penn Central, and then you go to Lucas, right? Even if you can't go to Lucas, you might still win under Penn Central. So in theory at least, in theory, if you're at the 99% level, you might win under Penn Central, but you won't win under Lucas. So, yes. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry. Please. Using, because I, either I saw you say it or heard you say it, but Penn is kind of the catch-all, correct? If it, yeah. It just goes south and you just don't know. You can kind of fall back on Penn. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to lose, though, right? Penn Central is one of those tests that you're going to lose. So if for whatever reason you can't meet the test in Loretto and you can't meet the test in Lucas, you fall back to Penn Central, right? But, but, but to be frank, Penn Central is like the, the base. It's the bottom, right? You always have Penn Central to fall back on, but that involves the, the distinct investment back expectations and the parcel as a whole, which you're going to lose. So, you know, you can either lose or lose. Depends how you want to lose. Remember uh, from Ghostbusters, right? Choose a form of your destroyer. Right, basically, Penn Central is your, your gozer, right, or your state buff marshmallow, and that's going to destroy you. Um, that, that's all you have. Um, so how do you want to lose? Right, you're going to have this if you ever go to court. A judge will ask you at some point. They'll say, "Counselor, how do you want to lose?" Right, because sometimes there might be two or three different ways to rule against you, and you have to pick the least best, way, the, the the least bad way of losing, and they usually use the least bad way of losing. Right? Maybe you lose on a jurisdictional argument rather than the merits. So there's usually a bad way. Um, I see Terry has her hand up. I think Jessica had her hand up as well. Um, Jessica, you want to go first, then Terry in a minute? You still have a question, Jessica? Okay, so I think you basically answered my question, but we're going to act, we're going to go to Penn Central. But the economic, I guess the thing was, I was, I was thinking in my head, I thought, well, I would go to Lucas before I went to Penn Central and say, was there a total economic? You can, loss? right. So, so really, it's almost like a loop. Right, so you might you go, um, you know, uh, it's not a straight line because in in, in some cases it might be had to check because there's a nuisance, and in other cases you may uh, 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 stop at Lucas. Maybe you stop at had to check. Right, you're gonna have to go back and forth. It's not it's not a straight line. Um, I'll give you another table reference. Hotel California, you check in, you're not checking out. You're always gonna go back to Penn Central, and you're stuck. Yes, Terry, I see your hand is up. Okay, but but what do you mean by permanent? The word permanent is actually very hard to interpret. Like a uh, like not a time frame, not not like a term of years or months, but like for as long as you have the property, they are going to 
either totally restricted use. Well, again, if it's if it's a total restriction for life, um, right? If it's a total restriction for life, it's permanent. Well, don't say permanent. I, I know that word's in there, but just I, I would and let, let me explain why. Terry's asking a good question, right? So let's say that um, you know the government says we want to put a moratorium on building. You can't build for five years, right? The economic value of your land is basically zero. But in theory, on the sixth year, it returns 100%, right? So what happens on year six, they just renewed another five years, they renewed another five years, they keep going on and on, right? There's another case reference in your reading called Tahoe Sierra. Tahoe Sierra. And Tahoe Sierra said, as long as the moratorium is temporary, at least on paper, it's not permanent, right? Because it can be renewed and maybe they'll cancel it in five years. So as much as I love Lucas, it was basically gutted by Tahoe Sierra. So all South Carolina had to do is say, well, we're not banning construction forever. We're banning it for five years. And we'll consider in five years, we want to ban another five years and then another five years and another five years and another five years before you know it, you have 40 years, right? That's what California does. They just, they don't make permanent moratoriums on building. They just have a lot of temporary ones stacked one after the other. So um, Terry, I, I, I think you're, you're reading correctly, but from my own perspective, I would avoid using the word permanent because it suggests a time frame that's not, um, that, might, that might confuse you. Uh, yes, Catherine, I see your hands up. So if we were to look at this and we said, basically like if you can't fall under Loretto or you can't fall under Lucas, you're gonna lose. You're back in Hotel California. You're back in. You're back in the um, uh, Penn Central test, and and it's the if you're a takings lawyer, right? If you this is your if your your practice, if you're a takings lawyer, your entire existence is getting out of Penn Central. You're trying to find something for God's sake, anything to get out of Penn Central, because once you're in Penn Central, you're probably going to lose. Now, to use Mike's example, if there's a 99 percent diminution in the value of your property you actually might win under the Penn Central test. You actually might have a viable claim, but usually it's not 99%, it's something a lot less, right? You still retain some value. I just think about this case for a bit, right? The government says you can't build on your property on a beachfront resort. Well, maybe you can go camping. Maybe you can have a sleeping bag with a tent, right? Maybe you can, you know, pull up an RV, right? Now, the guy didn't drop a million dollars to have a campground, right? That's not why he, he bought this land. Let's just be, be honest here. But there's still some economically viable use. Not what you expected. Um, and one of the big criticisms of Scalia is he discounts or his test is sort of um, too broad. There's always some economic use to land. Maybe you can observe nature. Maybe you can go swimming, right? Maybe you can go tanning on the beach, right? Jersey style, right? There are different things you can do. Um, but Scalia puts his test that when you have a complete diminution of economic value, right? You are down to the Lucas test. There is no social contact. <laughs> yeah, uh, what's this in the bottom? No, it's not working, you have to disappear. No, you're... Only Zoom. Okay. Only only Zoom. Oh, there is no social contact. Only Zoom. Okay. Very good. All right. So everyone get that part of the Scalia test, right? The, the key question is, is there all economically beneficial use eliminated, right? Is there any economically beneficial use remaining? Yes, Catherine. No, it would not be. The Tahoe Sierra case said the exact opposite. When there's only a five-year ban in place, it's not permanent because in theory it runs out after five years, even if it's renewed. You see, Justice Stevens dissented in Lucas. Justice Stevens wrote the majority in Tahoe Sierra. He basically killed Scalia's opinion. They took Tahoe Sierra out of the book, which I regret, but it was that was a good case for it. Uh, you you should use Lucas, um, but don't use the word permanent. 
don't 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 think about the time frames. That's what I'm trying to get at. The fact that it's five years versus lifetime doesn't really make a difference. So at the point in time. Yeah. As of right, uh, right. If in fact there is a permanent ban, like the one in South Carolina, then it's a complete economic devaluation. But if I give you a five year limit, well, that's temporary. You'll have you'll value in the sixth year. Yes, Mike. I see your hands up. Off of Catherine's deal, as far as the Tahoe Sierra, if you go back to court after 25, five-year terms and go, hey, this looks permanent, wouldn't that work? Uh, not that I know of. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, look, the, 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 court, the, the court did other things in Tahoe Sierra beyond the five-year limit, but it's pretty crappy, right? So smart states can just avoid takings by, by keep rolling the clock. Yeah, Terry. Did um, Palazzo expand um, Penn Central to include um, property acquired even after the effective? Um, yeah, pa- don't uh, Palazzo. I think that's it's Palazzo of Rhode Island. Don't worry about that case. That case is even worse. I used to teach and I stopped. Let, 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 Terry, your question's a good one. I'm not trying to cut short, but this doctrine's incoherent, right? You have decisions made by the Supreme Court over the course of 40 years that are completely inconsistent. Um, and trying to piece them together is a very dangerous thing. The best summary I can give you is you're going to lose. Um, <laughs> if you're a property owner, you're going to lose because you're going to be in Penn Central eventually and you're going to lose. Um, even Wisconsin against Murr, I'm sorry, Murr against Wisconsin from a couple of years ago, they lost, right? There are very few takings cases where, this, where the Supreme Court rules for the property owner. The only exception is Loretto and horn where there's a where they physically seize your stuff right where there's a permanent physical occupation they take your raisins they take your cable whatever right the court is very comfortable finding it taking in those cases it's for whatever reason it's simple but once you get beyond that property owners usually lose kilo right i mean i can just run down the list of cases it's very rare where property owners win there are a few cases involving flooding but even the flooding case involved permanent physical occupations. So they're just, it's, it's not treated well at the Supreme Court. They don't like property rights. It just doesn't, doesn't get respect. Like Rodney, just no respect. None. None. Okay. All right. Let's walk through the Scalia opinion a little bit more. Um, Scalia then, so Scalia tweaks uh, Penn Central. And he also tweaks how to check a little bit. And he says, how to check stands for a broader proposition that certain types of noxious uses are not permitted. And when you buy a piece of property, you are on notice what sort of uses are prohibited. Therefore, when the government restricts your property to eliminate one of these uses, there's no surprise. Let me explain it a different way. When we talk about the distinct investment-backed expectations, think of the word expectations, right? Um, I can't expect to build you know, a toxic waste dump on a street in Houston, right? On a residential block. Because I know that's a common law nuisance, right? I can't reasonably expect to build this. And if the government actually makes a law saying you can't build a toxic waste dump, I should not be surprised by that, right? My expectations were I can't build it, and therefore there's no interference in my expectations. Think now about South Carolina. When Lucas bought this house, he expected to build a, I'm sorry, when Lucas bought the land by the beach, he expected to build a house. There were other houses in the block. Everyone expected they can build beachfront property. So his expectations would have been you can build. What Scalia is getting at here is very crafty. Scalia says that the government can't define new types of nuisances to shut you down. Only those nuisances that existed at common law are permissible. Why? Because we understand what the common law nuisances are and we have expectations based on those nuisances. Right? Lucas would have never anticipated this construction would have been prohibited. 
So therefore, it's unlawful to subject him to these novel types of environmental laws. So the upshot of the Scalia opinion is it's backward looking. Whatever restrictions existed at common law can be imposed on property without paying compensation. But whatever types of new novel restrictions on land use are not part of the expectations of the property owner and therefore their takings. So Scalia, Scalia tried to freeze in place what are the grounds of possible land use regulations. Right? Does that make sense? Everyone get that. So uh, who's next? I think Celeste here? I know she has some difficulty with her computer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Leslie, I think you're here. Yes, I'm here. Okay, so Leslie, what does Scalia then say about um, about the uh, the no building near the beach? Is that like a common law nuisance that would have formed the background expectations of Lucas? Um, I see. I don't think he said it did because I know he talked about how you know, when he had bought the land, he expected to be able to build on it. And so right. it was kind of unfair to later go back Good. and say, oh, by the way, you can't. That's right. But but I, I think you answered my question like 80%. Just finish it off. At common law, was there any prohibition on building near beaches? Oh, no. Okay, very good. Thank you. And I think Jessica framed the question well in the chat. Scalia is trying to apply Penn Central with a little twist, right? Scalia did not have the votes to reverse Penn Central. I'm sure he would have if he could, but he didn't have it. So he sort of tweaked it. And he tweaked it in two ways, right? The first way he tweaked it involved the economically viable, I'm sorry, the, the economic value, right? Penn Central says, when does it go too far? When it interferes with, when it interferes with your distinct investment-backed expectations, right? What does it mean to go too far? Well, if it kills all economic value, then it goes too far, right? It's sort of defining the Penn Coal Penn Central test. And then it, does, it, it, it tweaks Penn Central in a second way, right? It says that if your regulation is based on common law nuisances, then there's no compensation that's required. But if it's something novel that did not fit into your expectations, right? You didn't expect to have this restriction, then it could be a taking as well. All right, so he's, Scalia is like trying to, to, to put a layer on top of Penn Central and Penn Coal, uh, but it's very messy. And, you know, you're, you're saying you go straight up, zigzag lines, there's not a good way of explaining it, but he's trying to tweak Penn Central to give property owners a realistic shot of winning, right? Under Lucas, you can actually win in certain cases. Uh, under Penn Central original, it's very hard to win at all. Okay. They weren't with me so far. It's a very complicated case. Scalia, Scalia is trying to do a lot, and he's not telling you everything he's doing because he needs to keep Anthony Kennedy on board. Right? This is the story of my life, right? Where you have Scalia's mastery is tempered by Kennedy's moderation. And it's like, uh, Scalia's like, I can't tell you what I really want to do, so I'm just going to sort of hint at it. Um, and that's why he gets, I think, dunked on by some of the dissents because they're, they're saying you're not really telling us what you're doing, right? You're doing something different that's not Penn Central. All right, I think I'm done with Scalia. Um, any questions in the majority before I go on to the other opinions? Again, Scalia, I mean, again, if he had five votes for that Kennedy, this would be a really easy case for you to read. But he had to, like, water it down and, and sort of put all this other language that's just, just gibberish for Kennedy. Oh, Justice Kennedy. All right. And Justice Kennedy wrote a brief concurrence where he concurred in judgment, where he basically said, well, I don't even agree with the majority. So the word, you know, does he even agree with the majority? He says, well, beachfront property does not lose all its value because of development restrictions. You have to consider the dibbies, right? And uh, nuisance are just one factor to consider. So Kennedy's like, I don't really care. None of this matters. Um, Justice Souter would have dismissed the case. Let me just explain what this means. 
Um, the Supreme Court has a discretionary docket. The Supreme Court's not required to take any cases. It's all discretionary. Um, occasionally, the Supreme Court will review a case and realize it's a very bad, uh, what's called a vehicle. A vehicle, what the hell does that mean? Um, there are disputes in the factual record. And the court doesn't like to refine facts. Usually facts are found in the trial court. And if the Supreme Court finds that the factual record is incomplete, they'll just dismiss it. They'll dismiss the case. And there's a phrase, right? Dig, D-I-G. Dismissed as improvidently granted. I'll, here, I'll, I'll, I'll put in the chat. Dig, dismissed as improvidently granted granted. In other words, you dismiss the writ because it was granted in error. And this happens maybe once a year where the court was like, whoopsies, we shouldn't take it. And this is actually kind of funny. Usually a law clerk makes a recommendation to take a case. And if it turns out the law clerk missed something very important, the law clerk gets in trouble. It's like, you idiot, why didn't you, why, why didn't, why didn't you realize this? Why did you waste our time with this case? Because they have to go through the time of briefing and arguing it. So every year we'll get one or two, what's called a dig, or they, they dig the case. I know, fascinating. All right. Uh, yeah. Mac, are you here? Yes, sir. All right, Mac, walk me through the Justice Blackman dissent. No relation, spelled differently. Uh, so he basically thinks that the economic value uh, can't be completely diminished. Why? Uh, because there's always value to the property. I mean, just by alienation alone, uh, there's value inherently. Yeah, very, very good. Thanks, Mac. Um, uh, so Blackman's like, e Scalia's test is wrong, but even if Scalia's test is right, it doesn't apply here. Because land always has value. You can sell it, you can camp on it, you can sleep on it, you can do different things. So even the Scalia test is not very useful. He says you can picnic, swim, camp in a tent, live in a movable trailer. You can enjoy the land. And Blackman basically says the court really wanted to decide this case and reached out to answer it. Right? Blackman also says that states can prohibit harmful uses. And this is not harmful uses limited to the common law. Because let's be frank, who knows what a common law nuisance is. I mean, you studied this in my class, or property one at least, and we studied uh, in torts as well. Nuisance is a fairly open-ended word, right? It means harm. Blackman says, there is nothing magical in the reasoning of judges long dead. And here he's taking a dig at Scalia for originalism. Yes, and uh, Tom, uh, he launches a missile to kill a mouse. Um, I would give Justice Blackman credit, but at this stage of his career, he was mostly gone. Uh, and his law clerks did all the heavy lifting. Um, there are actually stories about this where he would send memos to his law clerks and the, and the law clerk would say, um, or Black would say, do I need to site check this? And the clerk would say, um, no, it's fine. And like basically Black would just do no work. The clerks did all the heavy lifting at the end. He, he would retire about a year later. Uh, so uh, I'll give whoever Harry Blackman's law clerks were credit for the missile line, not, not Blackman. Um, so he would basically dissent everywhere. Uh, if you recall, Blackman also dissented in uh, Loretto, uh, the, 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 the cable case, because he said, we, don't, we shouldn't have any of these things. He would just let the uh, political process handle this. Okay. All right. Uh, who's next? Uh, is Demetrius here today? Demetrius, you here? No, I don't see you. Holly, I think I saw your name earlier. Okay, um, Holly, walk me through the Justice Stevens dissent, please. I mean, wasn't the gist of it that the rule is too rigid and narrow? No. No, that's good. Yeah. What 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 test would so, Steven? Uh, how would Stevens approach this case? Well, and he also said it like shouldn't be from the land the landowner's point of view. Mm-hmm. What am I not giving you? No, that's good. Keep going. You're good. Um, sorry. So. 
What? Okay, so that was kind of the first part was where he's talking about the landowner's point of view is, is wrong. Well, well, hold on, hold on. Let me ask this question. Scalia's test focuses only on economic value. Why are we limiting ourselves to economic value? Right, in other words, could there be non-economic value to using land? Could be non-economic value. Right, in other words, is there value that you can't put an economic price tag on? Yeah. Like what? Oh, is this a bundle of sticks? Yeah, very good, very good, very good. Thank you, thank you, Holly. So Stevens goes property 1L, right? He's just like you all. He's like, oh, bundle of sticks, right? You have the right to exclude. You can keep people off your land, right? You have the right to invite people onto your land. You retain many sticks in the bundle. You don't lose everything. Um, this is very similar to Justice Sotomayor's dissent in the, um, in the Raisin case in Horn, where she says you have to destroy each and every stick in the bundle. I think there's a lot of overlap between this, the, the Sotomayor dissent in Horn and Stevens' dissent in, um, in Lucas. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Stevens also complains that uh, this freeze is a common law in place. All right, now if you notice at the end, Stevens says, I respectfully dissent. Uh, but if you look at the end of Blackman's dissent, he just says, I dissent. And that's like the, that's like the mic drop. I'm not gonna drop it because of the camera, right? But that's the mic drop, right? Where it's like, like I dissent, I'm out, right? Where it's sort of like a disrespectful uh, pardon. Uh, and justices do that when they really wanna signal that they don't like the majority. Um, Terry asks us a question. Why just read it to us? Terry, it's long. I don't want to read it myself. Better if you ask it. So, okay. So the exception to the, category, the categorical rule is the common law interpretation of this. But the takings uh, clause is a federal law. So how is it that the exception is um, determined by common law versus state law? I don't understand. Oh, what what a perfect question to lead us to the next case. I, I know that wasn't deliberate, but it was such a good question. Thank you, Terry. So Terry asked a question, right? How can the federal constitution be restricted by state common law? Right? In other words, why would the U.S. Constitution, the Fifth Amendment, be constrained by what a given state says? And if state A has one common law and state B has another common law, how could it be that the federal constitution means different things in different states? Terry, is that kind of your question? Yes. Welcome to Wisconsin v. Murr. That's actually such a perfect lead in. Um, Wisconsin v. I keep saying Wisconsin v. Murr. I keep flipping. I'm sorry. Uh, Murr v. Wisconsin, 2017 case, addresses just that issue, right? What is the connection between state law and the takings clause, right? What's the connection? All right, the facts in this case are a little bit messy. Uh, is Nicole here? Yeah, I'm here. All right, Nicole, help us out, and I'll, I'll help you if you need, but the, what, what were the facts here in Murr? It, it's a little bit messy, I, I, I agree, but we'll try and make sense of it. Yeah, my understanding of it was um, two parent, or parents bought um, two adjacent lots. Okay. And they were smaller lots, and they ended up having to merge it due to an ordinance. Um, and they gave it to their children. And so um, later when they went to go sell it, they wouldn't let them sell the property separately. Okay, very good. Now, why, Nicole, just this is the harder follow up question. Why were they not allowed to sell the lots as separate lots? Um, due to the ordinance, it had to be over, I think, one acre. Oh, okay, this. very good. Okay, thank you, Nicole. I appreciate it. Um, so here's the situation you have two lots. Lot E and Lot F, and they're both next to each other. Um, lot E and F are actually quite small, right? I'm sorry, they're not, they're not small, but there's very little land to develop on. I think it was by the river. There was lots of jagged rocks and those cliffs and stuff, so it was hard to build. The city enacts a law that says you can only build on a lot that has at least one acre of suitable land. Okay, one acre of suitable land. Lot E did not have one acre and lot F did not have one acre. Okay, 
Therefore, they couldn't build on each lot individually. I'm sorry, they couldn't sell each lot separately. Okay. But then Wisconsin enacts what's called a merger provision. Right? A merger provision. If you own, if the same person owns both lot E and F, you can merge their land together and build. So basically both lots become effectively one lot. And if you want to sell both lots, you can sell them together. But they cannot be sold separately, right? You can sell lots E and F as a bundle. But you can't sell lots E and F separately. So here's what happened, right? They had the land appraised. The land was worth about $700,000 for the lots together. But if we sold lot F by itself, it was only worth $370,000. And lot E by itself was worth $40,000. In other words, the value of the land was diminished significantly if the lots were considered separate. So here comes a million dollar question. What is the parcel? What is the parcel as the whole? Well, let's go through our cases. In Penn Cole, they said the relevant parcel was the land under the house. That you couldn't dig under the house because it would cause the house to fall into the earth. But in Penn Central, they said, no, no, no. The parcel is not just the land but also the air rights to consider the entire parcel. So what's the relevant parcel here? Is the relevant parcel only lot E? In which case the land drops from, you know, $400,000 to $40,000. Or is the relevant parcel lots E and F that are merged? If so, and they're together, there's not much of a, di a diminution in value. Or is the answer something different? Do we ignore state law and consider a bunch of factors that are complete gibberish? Right? Those are options. The petitioner said we look only at lot E. The government says, no, no, we have this merger law. Follow state law. E and F are combined. And there's a third option that no one wanted, that we've considered all these useless factors. Which one does Justice Kennedy give us? Of course, door number three. Why not? Right? Why couldn't he just give us a simple test of you look to state law? So again, we're stuck with Justice Kennedy. Uh, uh, who's next? Uh, and we're stuck with Justice Kennedy. Okay, Avery, are you here? No, Avery. Okay. Ah, oh, Mike, my friend, you are next. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, Mike. So. Walk me through the Kennedy opinion, right? Why does Justice Kennedy not go, or how, how does Justice Kennedy define the parcel as the whole? Mm, see, I had Roberts as far as he's following the state law of Wisconsin. That's right. Robert's, Robert's opinion is nice and clean. You know what? You know what? Actually, Mike, let's start with Robert's. I this actually think it's a better way of doing it. Um, okay. Yeah, so yeah. So let's let's start with Robert's because uh, really the Robert's opinion, my friends, is fun. I mean, agree or disagree, it's clear. You know what? You know what yeah. the hell he's saying. That's what I got out of this. The Kennedy opinion, like whenever I teach, it's like, oh God, Tony, what were you thinking? All right, just you. It's like he took an area of law that sucked and made it suck even more. That's why I look at this case. All right, so. Uh, Mike, uh, give me the Roberts dissent, which was with Roberts uh, and Thomas and Alito. Uh, Scalia Harry died at this point, so he wasn't part of the case. So uh, they actually adopted the Wisconsin state law. Okay. They treat both lots as the same. And, and because, because Wisconsin law required them to be the same, right, Mike? Right. right. Okay. Why does Roberts decide to look to state law? Why does he use that framework? I know that they, they agreed this it wasn't a taking, but they didn't they didn't agree on why it was a taking. So I think that was the most logical step that Roberts thought. Okay. 
it was already a law. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, th thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. Right. So Roberts is basically saying this is hard. Right. Um, we already have something to go on. If state law considers E and F as a single merge parcel, so should we. And so under the state law, um, Murr loses. Right. Murr wanted only the um, what do you call it? The the lot F to count the the, the small one. But the court rejected that argument. And Robert says we can't let the property owner define the, the, the parcel so narrowly, right? Because every property owner will always define it as narrowly as possible. At least the state law approach gives some objective criteria. And I think Roberts has the better approach of the two. I think I would I don't mind this the 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 uh, uh, the, the argument more advanced, but I think the Roberts one is, is quite sensible. All right, now, I'm sorry, whoever's next. Uh, oh, Catherine, you're next. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, now let's go back to Justice Kennedy. Um, why does Justice Kennedy reject the state law approach, Catherine? The, the one that Mike just gave us a minute ago. Uh, because he said that you needed to balance the rights of the property owner against the government's power. <laughs> and a, like do this fact intensive inquiry yeah. um, to then, I guess, figure out what the best approach would be. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, uh, thank, thank you, Catherine. Um, Justice Kennedy doesn't like simple tests uh, in any context. Um, he always looks to have balancing factors. Right. So uh, uh, the court says state law is one factor to consider, but we want to be flexible. Right. We want to be flexible. Um, he looks to Penn Central and says we don't uh, uh, define a parcel as discrete segments. Right. We can't sever parts of the property. We have to look at the property as a whole. So then he lists four or five or seven factors. I'm not sure how you count it, right? So a number of factors. So first, the treatment of the land under state and local law. That's how Justice Roberts defines it, the first one. But then Kennedy keep, keeps going. The physical characteristics of the land. Okay. Um, I suppose if a land is very rocky or perhaps near water, maybe that changes the analysis. The third factor is the prospective value of the regulated land. Okay, so I guess if the land's valuable, it's more likely a taking, I suppose. Um, the, the next thing he writes is the endeavor should determine whether reasonable expectations of property ownership would lead a landowner to anticipate that his holdings would be treated as one parcel or instead as separate tracts. Um, and here, this discussion of reasonable expectations, um, I think is related to the DIBIs, the distinct investment backed expectations. Um, it doesn't really tell us, I'm not really sure what that means. So uh, this case This case uh, graphs a level of complexity onto Penn Central that didn't already exist, right? Penn Central said you have to consider the parcel as the whole. And Murr now gives us four or five or six factors to decide what is the parcel as the whole. Um, if you're asking me how to apply these factors, I have no idea. Um, I've taught this case now, I guess, two or three times since it's come out in 2017. I, I don't know what the hell he's getting at. And Roberts is very frustrated at how complicated this test is. Um, now, Justice Kennedy is not in the court anymore, so maybe this doctrine is short for this world. I don't know. Um, but it's a very confusing argument. Um, any questions the Kennedy opinion? Or at least those factors of Kennedy. I know it, it makes no sense, but these are this is... We lived in Anthony Kennedy's world. We no longer live in that world. That world has ceased to exist. 
Um, Lisa, oh God, Lisa, that's a long question. You want to read out loud, please, or just just talk to us for a minute? I don't like reading these long questions. I feel like I'm like a like a, like a chat room. It's, I'm live. We're, we're, we're zooming, right? This is real. I mean, reels we're going to get for the semester. Um, so basically, I mean, you know, reading through the Murr case, I would still think that everything should could still, you know, the, the Supreme Court could have left it alone. It still could have all been covered under Penn Central. Yes. And then the facts of even the things that they talked about in Penn Central, like what I had mentioned there, you know, about the, you know, the government denying a legitimate boundary line or the property interest that somebody has, you know, it, it's, it, it kind of affects the Penn Central's character of the government action prong. Yep. And, and then also, you know, that they're kind of, now they're stepping into the realm of reaching into states and telling states how they should, you know, define lands and property boundaries. And that kind of, for me, encroached into what states' rights are and how they, you know, legislate themselves. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Lisa. Let me, let me, let me, let me, uh, let me sort of elaborate on that a little bit. No matter what you do in this topic, you keep coming back to Penn Central. You keep, you can't avoid it. Even if you try and leave, it's like Hotel California. You check in, you don't check out. You just keep coming back to Penn Central. Um, Lisa made a second point that this incursion into states' rights. Well, let me let me just do a hypothetical of why I think Kennedy did what he did. Imagine the court adopted the Roberts test and said whatever state law says goes right. States can then adopt laws that are very restrictive and states can basically dictate the outcome of cases, right? If a state chooses to have a very broad merger law, then there's never a taking. So I think Kennedy was worried that states could jerry-rig the process and and sort of stack the deck against property owners. Uh, But in the process, he created this nonsensical test that's going to be impossible to apply. So I, I mean, I, I think I know why Kennedy does that. I try not to think too hard about his reasoning because it usually usually eludes me. Uh, but I think that's what he was getting at. All right, all right. Now let's talk about math for a minute. Um, there's all this discussion of the denominator in this opinion, and if you have any young kids at home, you remember from, I guess, elementary, middle school. I don't even know when you do denominators, right? You have fractions, or like. This is going to sound simple, but there's someone who doesn't know this. One half, right? One over two, right? Number two is the denominator. That's the number you're dividing by. So when we're talking about takings, we ask, what is the denominator? Are we saying the denominator is only the air rights? Or the denominator, the air rights plus the building? With math, when you make the denominator bigger, right? When you make the denominator bigger, the number shrinks. So one over two, one over three, one over four, one over five, it's a smaller percentage. So I'll give you an easy example, right? Let's say uh, a regulation decreases the value of the property by $10 million. And let's say the value of the property is $100 million. 10 over 100, right? It's 10, right? It's, it's 1 over 10. Now let's say you look at a bigger parcel. Let's say you make the denominator 1 over 200. Or I'm sorry, 10 over 200. As you add more stuff to the parcel, as the parcel becomes bigger, the denominator becomes bigger. And as the denominator becomes bigger, the diminution of value is less. So the goal of the parcel as a whole test is to increase the denominator and make it look not as bad. Well, you're not, you're not losing that much money. Look at all the value of elsewhere, right? You have the air rights, you have the surface rights, etc. So under the petitioner's approach, you only consider the value of the lot that you can't build on. And there, there's probably like a 90% diminution of value. But if you consider both lots, there's maybe a 10% diminution in value, right? But the denominator gets bigger. So when you have these denominator issues, it really impacts how much the value is diminished. And that's why the parcel as a whole test is so important. How you define the parcel often dictates the outcome of the case. There's always other land to build, right? Remember in Penn Central, you have the transfer credits, which are worthless, right? But you can go build somewhere else. 
There's always some value. Make the denominator as big as possible. The property owners want to make the numerator bigger and the denominator smaller. And the government wants to make the numerator smaller and the denominator bigger. And this is always the sort of conflict they have. Okay, here's your math lesson. Fifth grade, Malin tells us. I don't remember when we learned fractions. I can't recall. A long time ago. Okay, questions on the majority. Questions on the dissent. Anything the majority of the dissent? Someone raising their hand? No. All right, let me um, wrap up a little bit um, and then we'll uh, get out of here a couple of minutes early. All right, when you're thinking about takings cases, you have a lot to think about, right? We've covered a lot of material. Um, the easiest cases involve eminent domain, kilo when they're physically taking your property and they want to pay you for it, right? In those cases, there's no question whether there's a taking. The only question is whether there's a public use, right? Is, is taking a home to increase economic development a public use? Under Kilo, the answer is yes. But let's say the government lets you keep the title to your house. They're not demolishing it. They're just regulating it. Uh, we then consider whether there's a permanent physical occupation under Loretto. Are they taking your raisins? Are they drilling a hole in your wall? When you have these sort of per se takings, there's no need to, I'm sorry, there, there's no balancing involved. Compensation must be awarded. All right. The next set of cases you have to think about, right, is... What happens if they're not taking your property, right? What happens if they're not actually taking your property? They're merely reducing the value. In such cases, we have a lot of tests to consider, right? We have a lot of tests to consider. You have to think about, of course, how to check. Is there some sort of nuisance that's being policed? Okay. But even with how to check, we have to think about Lucas. Because Lucas said the nuisances are those defined in common law. You can't have these sort of modern nuisances. Right? So even how to check was somewhat modified by Lucas. But what if there's no nuisance? We go as we always go to Penn Central. And we think about what are the expectations of the owner, right? What were his expectations when he purchased it? If we find that there is a complete diminution in all economic value, that is completely non-economically viable, Penn Central tell, I'm sorry, Penn, Lucas tells us that there's a taking. But what if there's some value Right? Maybe it's just a temporary moratorium, only for five years at a time. The Tao Sierra case, which I mentioned, tells us that there's no compensation required. And then when we're deciding how to define the parcel as a whole, state law is one factor to consider, but there are many other factors to consider. And this is why taking law is an absolutely incoherent nightmare. Um, it's just a disaster. Um, you know, I would rather teach future interests than teach this topic. I can teach you future interest. There's a rule. I can tell you what a fee simple determinable is, and I can be certain what it is. With a taking, it's very incoherent and very difficult to apply. <sighs> okay. Questions? Malin, your background keeps changing like a chameleon there. Everything okay? Okay, good. Yeah, you're, you're, like, you're like ghosting from one thing to another. Um, questions on this topic? Oh, my God. There's a really long thing that someone typed. Uh, Lisa, you want to talk to us for a second? I'm not reading that. It's too long. You can say it. I didn't think it was that long. <laughs> it's long. I, I'd much rather hear from people. I look at a computer screen all day. I can actually like, interact with human beings. So I was just asking, like, so if we, run, if we were to run into something like the merge situation on the exam, could we, instead of 
like going through the huge confusing conundrum that they have in MERS? Can we, you know, could we do the analysis, you know, like looking at the parameters, of, you know, whatever state law if that was given, you know, and then. You know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, it, Lucas or I, I, I get you. I get your I get your answer. <clears throat> the short the short response to Lisa is there's no coherent way of answering a takings question in exam. Everyone does it slightly differently. And I get what you're doing. Um, what I want you to see is you actually thought through the different tests and considered which one was relevant. That's why I want to see. He's like, well, this test is relevant. This test is not really relevant. And you'll sort of back and forth. But, but it, it's not easy. Uh, Terry, I see that your hands up. If it's modern, it's not common law, my friend. It, yeah. Under Lucas, if it's modern by legislature, it's not common law. So modern is by the legislature. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, if it's by the legislature, if it's new, it's not. It's not. It's not common law. Uh, one note. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, we were planning to move to evaluations, another professor evaluations. And even before Corona blew up, we were going to do this online. So at some point, I don't know exactly when you'll get an email. An email will say class climate evaluation or class climate survey. I don't know why it's called that. It's a ridiculous name. I don't know what the hell that means, but that's just evaluation. So don't delete that email. Um, uh, I don't even know what they're considered for this year. I think it's actually bizarre because we're all, you're paying a lot of money to sit in a virtual classroom, but it's, it's a bit, best, I, I know it sucks. There have been lawsuits by students against their schools uh, uh, claiming refund of tuition. Uh, there was a class action filed against I think, the University of Miami where students complained they didn't pay to get uh, an online, you know, correspondence course education. Uh, I don't know those fourth uh, case will go anywhere. Um, if you actually look in your uh, tuition agreements, these have what are called force majeure clauses. Yes, the force majeure, the act of God. Um, and there's actually a lot of litigation whether the corona is a force majeure. Uh, I don't know if it is, it's beyond my expertise, but people are complaining to other schools. Okay. Uh, this was a very interesting article on, let's see who wrote it. Uh, okay, I, I haven't seen it, but thank you for sharing the link. If you notice when you put a link into Zoom, you can't click on it. Um, and the reason why is Zoom doesn't want you clicking on hijack links that can try and take over your computer. That's why you can't actually put an actual link inside the, the chat box. Okay, anything else? All right, I will sign back online in a minute if you want to ask me any questions. Uh, but for now, have a good night. I'll see you all next Tuesday.